Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining on behalf of the Taproot team. I'm very, very happy to welcome you to today's event. Uh, it's a social issue spotlight panel where we're talking about education nonprofits. We have some really great speakers today, so I'm looking forward to a really good conversation. Uh, we're excited to have you here for this luncheon and learn or breakfast and learn if you're from the West Coast. I know we have a couple Californians and uh, folks on the call. Um, for those who I haven't personally met yet, you may have seen some emails from me come through already. Um, my name is Kimberly Swartz. You can call me Kim. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm Taproot's uh, Senior Director of Community Engagement which really just means I, I work on designing programs and managing uh, the teams that help bring nonprofits together with volunteers for really impactful partnerships. Um, so really looking forward to some of the, the great conversations and maybe some of the partnerships that come from this event as well. Uh, so I, uh, especially want to make sure I, I make a quick note that this is a cool day for us to be holding this discussion as uh, as some folks on the line, especially those from nonprofit organizations may be aware. Uh, April is Global Volunteer Month. And so this event, you're helping us officially kick it off. We didn't want to host an event on April Fools just in case it uh, uh, you know, weirded anyone out, uh, made people think like the event actually wasn't going to happen yesterday. So we technically are kicking things off a day early, but I hope you'll forgive us there. Um, but Global Volunteer Month is uh, a month of service led by our friends at Points of Light. And it's a really special time to celebrate the impact of volunteerism and also invite more community members to uh, find ways to get involved, whether that's hands-on local volunteering or uh, virtual volunteering, like the skills-based volunteerism that you'll hear more about during today's discussion. Um, so today, as I mentioned, we're joined by nonprofit leaders and experts from organizations fighting for and providing equitable access to high quality education uh, and supporting those who are offering high quality education. Um, as uh, you may have seen in the description for today's event, you know, we're thinking, reflecting back on that famous Horace Mann's quote of, you know, education as the great equalizer. And, uh, you know, that quote being published now more than 175 years ago. Um, and we know the sentiment remains true as higher levels of education do correlate with greater economic and social mobility. But we also know that substantial hurdles are in place for ensuring this equitable access to education. And so what can sometimes feel uncertain for individuals is, you know, I'm only one person, what can I do to support and advocate for education access in my own community or, or maybe across uh, the states, across the, the world? And so today we're going to hear from nonprofit leaders who are working on the ground and really uh, addressing these challenges head on within our own communities. Um, and they'll share a bit about how you can take action to support their organizations and organizations like them and, and some important things to keep in mind when you are partnering or looking to partner with organizations like yours. Um, and so really appreciate everybody who submitted questions before this event. Um, we'll make sure we touch on some of the most popular questions to kind of kick off our panel. But I will ask that folks use the chat box, use the Q&A box. I think we enabled that in case you want to ask some anonymous questions. Or if you're familiar with Zoom, there is a raise hand function. And so if you do feel comfortable coming off of mute and just chatting with uh, our panelists yourself, we definitely welcome that. Um, so just give me that hands up, uh, you know, heads up so I can make sure I call on you and, and we can keep the, the conversation flowing well. Um, a few additional logistic notes. Uh, we are recording this panel. We don't want to miss out on any of the great insights that our panelists share. Um, and I saw a couple people may have to bounce early. Totally, totally fine. Um, we will attempt to share out this recording in our follow-up note. 
either this later this afternoon or tomorrow morning at the latest. And it'll also be published on the Tappert website for easy viewing after the fact. Um, we're gonna ask that you keep yourself muted while our panelists are sharing. Uh, but like I said, definitely use that, that hand raised function so that we can call you off mute um, and get those questions um, asked. And then if you do have any uh, tech uh, support needs, please shoot a private chat to my Taproot colleague on the line. Uh, Kristen uh, is standing by uh, ready to support. So just send her a note if you do need anything. Yep, and Kristen just gave a little wave uh, and her name is indicated with Taproot support as well. So hopefully she's easy to find um, in the, the Zoom chat box. All right, so with the logistics notes underway, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful speakers. We're joined by two uh, really, really interesting uh, nonprofits who are working in this very broad space of education, and they're each coming at it uh, from different angles. Um, and so really, really curious to hear uh, all of the insights they have to share today. Uh, so first up, I want to introduce Tessa Zimmerman, uh, who comes to us from Upstream Education. Uh, Tessa recognized firsthand the lack of mental health resources within the school system. And so she created Upstream Education, which is a nonprofit organization that trains and equips educators with tier one mental health tools. Upstream Education's tools are based on the practices of mindfulness and positive psychology and can be really easily integrated throughout the school day in classes um, or small group settings, one-on-one -on -one settings, staff meetings, etc. And during the school year, Upstream impacts uh, over 45,000 students weekly, which is, you know, when I first read that set, and even now it's, um, I mean, it's, it's huge to reflect on. Um, and they've partnered with major school districts, including Denver Public Schools and the Pasadena Unified School District. Uh, really amazingly, Tessa made the 2024 Forbes 30 under 30 list for upstream scale and impact. So really huge year for her and the nonprofit. Um, and just this month, Upstream was awarded Morgan Stanley's Alliance for Children's Mental Innovation Award for their bite-sized tools approach. So we're, we're talking with Tessa at just this really exciting moment for her and the organization and so grateful for her joining the call today and sharing her time and perspective with us. All right. Um, and then secondly, we're joined uh, by the wonderful Pallavi Abraham, who comes to us from a nonprofit called Teachers Supporting Teachers. Um, Pallavi is an educator and an entrepreneur, uh, much like many of our wonderful nonprofit uh, leaders across Taproot, that entrepreneurship um, really rings true here. Uh, she started her career serving Chicago's most under-resourced schools, teaching AP biology as well as biochemistry. Um, and she then went on to join the founding team at Teachers Supporting Teachers which is a local nonprofit organization that's committed to improving teacher retention, um, which as we know, is a really big challenge across the United States today. So as teacher supporting teachers first executive director, she was committed to building equitable systems as the organization scaled, making TST the largest teacher leadership provider to Chicago public schools. She holds a BS in molecular biology from the University of Michigan, a master's degree in secondary science education from Johns Hopkins University, and is currently an MBA candidate at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Today, she's a strong advocate that business can and should be a strong lever for social change. So I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs on the line today, and I just, I think Pallavi's voice is such an interesting one and that perspective coming from kind of these different sectors and, and funneling it um, into an organization really dedicated to building education uh, systems capacity to affect change on individual students' lives, um, but also systems system level change as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to hear more about both of your nonprofits. So without further ado, I want to turn the mic over to our wonderful panelists. And Tessa, perhaps I'll start with you first. I would love to just have folks on the line get a sense of why do you do what you do? You know, why were you called to the work that you're currently doing with upstream education in the first place. Thank you, Kimberly, for that introduction. 
Uh, so I started upstream because I grew up having really severe panic attacks in the classroom since I was eight. Um, and whenever I'd have a panic attack, my teachers were always the first responders that never really knew what to do. Uh, usually I got handed a stress ball or I was sent to the principal's office and I found both responses to be really frustrating. I really wanted to learn how to manage my emotions, how to not end up in the panic attack. And it wasn't until I received a full scholarship to a private high school that really prioritized student mental health. Every morning in homeroom, we would learn different practices to manage our emotions, to self-regulate. And it completely changed my education experience. I went from being a student who hated going to school to a student who loved going to school because all of a sudden there was moments throughout the day to really like pause and center oneself. Uh, and when I got to college, I recognized the inequity in my education experience. I'd been extremely blessed to get a full scholarship to a private high school that was ahead of the game in the social emotional learning tier one mental health space, um, but believe all students deserve to have access to these tools. And so upstream really stemmed from this question of like, how do we equip the first responders to student stress and anxiety with concrete tools? And, and how do we do that in a way that's intuitive and non-burdensome to educators? And so really upstream started from my firsthand experience of I really wish I didn't get handed a stress ball or I didn't get sent to the principal's office for having anxiety and recognize that this was a common experience um, for students across the country and a problem that needed to be solved. So I hope that answers your question. It absolutely does. And I really appreciate you sharing that just firsthand lived experience that now is, is funneled into the mission of your nonprofit. And I'm looking forward to digging a little bit more into of how you operate programs and maybe how volunteers can play into that as well. But first, uh, Pallavi, I would love to hear about your experience and kind of what led you to, because you have such a diverse background. And so what did end up being that motivating factor that brought you into the nonprofit world with teachers supporting teachers? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you could tell from my bio, my Apparently, I love school. That seems to be like a theme <laughs> of my life is that um, I have wanted to be a teacher since the age of six. I remember like being in my first grade classroom and like storing away ideas and being like, I'm going to do that when I'm a teacher. And that like love of school and the impact that it had on me um, from the age of three all the way through me getting my college degree, I knew that this is the field that I wanted to um, continue to serve in. And I had two really like pivotal experiences in my early career that have really driven me to doing the work I'm doing today. So that first one, um, as I mentioned, I knew I was going to be a teacher. I was a traditionally trained teacher. I had done um, the full certification um, and then moved to Chicago and was enthusiastically there in my first year of teaching, ready to go, ready to change lives, uh, stand and deliver. And I was placed in a alternative school on Chicago's South Side. And alternative school in Chicago has a specific uh, meaning, which is our students were over age and under credit. And that meant that they probably had, instead of two barriers to success, had five to six barriers to success. And on top of all of that, I was at a campus that had had uh, administrative change every two years. And so as you can imagine, that level of instability in an institution does not for good systems make. And as you can imagine, everything felt like my head was on fire at all times. And the I found uh, I was really lucky in that my the campus I was placed at, unlike a lot of charter schools, had a cohort of teachers who had been there for 15 or 20 years. And they just kind of like took me under their wing and they said, I think you know you I think you think you know what you're doing. You don't. We've got you. Don't worry. This place is a mess, but it doesn't matter because we as this cohort of teachers can really become the soul and the lifeblood of a school. And it almost became, and this is a bold statement, systems agnostic that 
the passion and the drive that those teachers were bringing to the table were really able to elevate our students beyond those barriers that they were experiencing and get them their their full degrees. And that was really the driving force that like showed me what teachers are truly capable of. Um, I had another experience about six, seven years later where I had been teaching in schools for like six, seven years at this point, And suddenly things in my personal life weren't holding up. My mom was sick. We'd had a death in the family. And I wasn't able to show up as the educator I wanted to be because of things happening in my personal life. And what that showed me is that the systems of my workplace were not set up for me to grieve, be a caretaker, and still show up in the way that my students really needed me to show up. Remote work is not an option. This is like pre-COVID many moons ago. Um, and I found myself at a, a, a juxtaposition in my career where I knew where my heart was, but I knew what, what I was capable of doing in that moment. And I had to leave my dream career. And I found myself falling attrition, falling victim to the exact thing that I had said I was not going to do. I was not going to quit. I was going to be that career teacher. And yet here I was leaving the classroom. So those two experiences, the one of teachers being the soul and lifeblood of the school, and the fact that the systems of my workplace, for someone who was that excited to be a teacher, weren't set up, it made me, drove me to joining Teacher Supporting Teachers. So this is an organization I've been volunteering for, and their commitment to the mission of um, solving teacher retention um, is really what has been my, my work for the last uh, seven years. So yeah. I'll pause there. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, and just as a, a quick heads up, we love bold statements here. So so don't be afraid to, to keep making those, um, keep them coming. Um, and I really appreciate what you share just around uh, like the supportive structure, just not existing for people to bring them full selves into the workplace. And I'm sure I know we have some folks here who are from the corporate world as well as the nonprofit world, but I, I wonder um, how that sentiment resonates with, with the folks who are tuned in. And um, I think perhaps for this next question, um, I'll start with you, Pallavi, because I'm really curious to hear more about the programs of teachers supporting teachers and kind of the core audience of your work and how your services really do try and build up this supportive structure for educators. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit um, and first talk about like what is uh, causing the teacher retention and teacher attrition crisis we're seeing uh, nationwide. Um, and just from like a, a human capital perspective, a lot of us join uh, companies where we see ourselves learning and growing and we can see a trajectory of um, professional growth and promotion within our workplace. Schools are not set up that way. Schools are set up that if you show up in a classroom and you're excellent, either you're plucked up and out of a classroom to become an administrator, which is an entirely different position than being a teacher. Um, and so what ends up happening in that is that we end up having this revolving door of the best people not being in front of students. Um, and in addition to that, there are all of these additional barriers to teachers being able to stay, the burnout, um, in which we're seeing this like revolving door. We really want our best people to be in front of students. And when you think about the trajectory of a teacher's career, there are two main attrition points. The first attrition point is in those first two years. Plenty of people are were excited like me and they get there. And in the first two years, they're like, never mind, this, this is not it. This is not what I dreamt it was going to be. The barriers to our students being successful are so high. I'm I'm going to be up and out. The pay isn't worth it. Like one cannot be fueled on passion alone. Let me tell you, does passion doesn't pay bills. And the second attrition point being uh, at year five or six, which is really where teachers hit their peak of effectiveness. And then teachers start looking around and they're like, hmm, now what? Where? How do I continue learning and growing and developing if I don't want to be a principal? And what schools haven't figured out is middle management. What does it mean to lead other adults, to coach, to develop your professional skills, but without leaving your core job, which is being a teacher? And so that's really where teacher supporting teachers comes in, is we we call ourselves like the 
queens of middle management. We help principals and schools build those distributed leadership structures in which teachers are leading teams. They are um, leading a math team. They're leading the instructional leadership team, the um, student uh, emotional support team, you name it. We help teachers who are ready for that next phase of their development. And we hold their hand through that entire year that they're with us, helping them really lead really effective teams. And part of leading effective teams is building systems, building strong culture, um, and building a team. And so we really evaluate our effectiveness, not just on did they lead a team, but did that teacher who was a leader in their building return the next year? And did their team, the people that they empowered, did they return the, the following year? So effectively what we're doing is we're building these systems and structures that allow not just every teacher, but those the best teachers, the ones who are excited and passionate about staying, we create those roles for them and we support them through their first couple of years in leadership. I love that focus on retention, but on the same, you know, other side of that same coin, the focus on um, effectiveness as well, you know, really uh, taking high performers and, and making sure they, they have what they need to continue thriving. So Tessa, I wanna turn uh, the mic over to learn more about your organization's programming because I know you're coming at education from a different angle. And um, I, I wanna hear more about kind of what is the core audience of your nonprofit's programs and um, how are you serving them? Thank you. Yeah, so Upstream, we partner um, with schools and districts that really wanna take a proactive and preventative approach to student mental health and well-being. Uh, so we noticed um, the problem of that there's like not enough people trained to support students and their well-being. So uh, I'm based in Colorado. In Colorado, there was uh, a report that came out a couple of years ago um, by the Hopeful Futures campaign, and they found that um, there's one school social worker for every 2,258 students. Um, when the recommended ratio is actually uh, one school social worker for every 250 students, right? So there's kind of like this really apparent gap um, in school buildings of people that have the tools to support students. Um, and, you know, we don't want to burn out teachers either um, and give them more than their workload. But what we found is that how do we give them these bite-sized tools that are plug and play so they're ready to go? that teachers can use to start off their class periods or an advisory period or homeroom. So at Upstream, what we do is we offer this curriculum of 120 bite-sized tools, meaning all of our tools take less than 10 minutes. Um, our tools are designed to foster self-regulation and stress management and really equip students with the strategies to kind of navigate, navigate the inevitable stressors and challenges of life. Um, we say we're tier one, which means we're universal support. So we're designed to reach all students in a school building, but we do not like replace the like mental health professionals. We just help schools take a more proactive and a preventative approach. Um, and what we've also found is that these tools support adult well-being. So a lot of our schools are actually using our strategies um, at the start of staff meetings, just because they want to create a culture of everyone's mental health matters in a school building, and we're going to give everyone these tools to support. Um, and so, yeah, we train the school staff, but then they deploy the tools um, to students. Um, and I would just like the other thing I'll just like quickly name and what we do is that we also ensure that our program is constantly iterating and responsive to the community's needs. Cause we found that if you really wanna serve students you actually have to include and amplify their voices in our programming. Um, so we actually have a student task force um, made up of 10 students from different upstream schools across the country that we pay over the summer to actually like serve as consultants um, where they actually edit uh, 24 of our lessons and propose new strategies um, to the program. Uh, so again, like in summary, what we're doing is like, how do we take this proactive and preventative approach to student mental health by make it, making it really easy for schools to teach concrete strategies throughout the academic day 
and then ensuring that those strategies are relevant and engaging to the students we serve by incorporating their feedback and voice in the program development. And I love the student advisory committee idea. I think that that's just such a wonderful day, you know, to empower and enable uh, students to have agency and how these resources, how the supportive structures for both them and, and also um, educators come together. It's it's fascinating. I can't wait to dig in more um, just personally. But for this, the sake of this conversation, I want us to slightly switch gears because I'm sure uh, there's plenty of folks on the line who are curious about, okay, well, how could I start getting involved with supporting education organizations like the two I'm hearing from today. And so would love to maybe hear an example from both of you, because I know you have varying levels of experience working with skills-based volunteers, like the ones that come through Taproot's programs. But I'm wondering if you would be willing to share just an example of kind of how you've tapped into volunteer support before at each of your organizations and maybe what that looked like from a uh, pro bono um, lens or a skills-based volunteer support lens. Uh, I won't assign anyone to go first. So whoever comes off mute first, you, you get the mic. I can go first. Um, yes. So I think that two lenses, so one being our organization in uh, in particular, and then more largely education. And I'm sure um, some of the latter bucket will echo Tessa's sentiments as well, because this is a field that um, really is going to take a full community of support to be able to close the gaps that we're seeing. So for us with teachers supporting teachers, in terms of the way that we've engaged with uh, skills-based volunteers in a couple of different ways, I think one tactically is all things marketing. As a small nonprofit, you can imagine we want to make sure that most of our dollars are going directly to serving teachers and schools um, and if you're familiar with the nonprofit space, there are many um, restrictions around how dollars can get spent. And people really want to see uh, donations going directly to what is called programming. And then we've got this whole other bucket called overhead, where we nonprofits are like kind of shamed for spending. And yet, if when you invest in overhead, that is really what allows you to grow your donor base, allows you to grow your impact. And so when you kind of think about what are the things in overhead, this is where the skills-based volunteers. We love a taproot volunteer when it comes to marketing, when it comes to helping us with building financial plans, when it comes to um, looking at like strategic growth initiatives. We've had volunteers um, help us in lots of different ways. I think like a really tactical one is our annual report every year is always designed by a taproot volunteer. Um, and that annual report is what helps us bring donations in every year. I walk around pounding the pavement with a beautifully printed copy um, that that volunteer made for us. And uh, our donors and our larger community is always so impressed by that. It makes our organization look that much more committed to the cause because of that support from the community we got from Taproot. So when I think about like skills-based volunteers, I always kind of bucket it under like those overhead pieces. Um, and then there's like the tactical, the programmatic side of it, which is to really get involved in programming. And that looks like we have community-based events where we bring in speakers. We always have volunteers help us work those events. Um, I know like because our programming is much more systems and teacher-based, it's we're not we're not doing like digs with kids or planting or mentoring. Um, where I know a lot of other education organizations have opportunities to really get involved with students. Ours are much more systems-based, so a lot of those community events is where people can get involved directly with the organization. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, Tessa, do you want to talk about yours before we kind of talk a more largely about getting I involved? just hit home when you said, oh, like, everybody just wants you to spend money on programming, and, like, for it's like, please don't spend our money on overhead mm -hmm. or general operatings. Um, yep. So that really resonated and I would just echo that like 200% is that everyone wants the money to go to programming which is wonderful right it allows us to do the work um but as you shared like we need to like market our programs and have all these other systems in place to actually really be of service 
Um, so I would just name similarly, like we've um, tapped Taproot for uh, really that communication support. So like for us, like an area of growth has always been like, how do we consistently communicate what we're doing? Um, because we can be so heads down, like in the work that we forget to be like, oh, we should be like sharing the work on social media and we take a risk and have a high school senior manage our social media accounts, um, which our attorney doesn't love, but we love because we think it shares more about like the student experience. Um, that being said, so we like we reached out to Taproot to say like, hey, we need a communications plan. Like that's been a piece of feedback that we've received from our donors. We don't really know where to begin. Again, like our funders don't want us to actually like spend a bunch of money on this marketing or communications plan, but we, we know we need to deploy this. Um, so that kind of that specific scale, I think the marketing space is like right on um, that we've also needed. And then in addition, we've, we have a program advisory board um, is something we run where our director of programs kind of curates a variety of different perspectives. So we have, a few mental health professionals, licensed social workers, a couple of like child development psychologists and professors, just a wide variety of lenses to really look at our program. And they convene, I think once a quarter um, to really just say like, here's some programmatic challenges we're having. Um, like, what would you advise on how we navigate it? Or let's review some of the tools and lessons in the curriculum. Um, so that's kind of how Again, we're not really working directly with students, so there isn't like that mentorship opportunity, but the way in which we involve folks in our program is just advising on like the curricular aspects. Um, so I'll stop there. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it seems like that's a bit of a through line um, between both of both of your organizations. So I know, Pallavi, you wanted to touch on kind of the broader lens of how can advocacy individual volunteerism just support this cause as a whole? And so I'll, I'll move to you next um, on that regard, but wanna make a quick note that we're around 20 minutes left of our time today. So if you do have questions, please you know, keep throwing those in the chat or use that Zoom raise hand function um, so that it can get you in the queue. I also have a couple questions that came in from some folks who are gonna be watching the recording back. So I'll jump into those um, after uh, Paula V, we move to this next section. So please take us away. Yeah, so just kind of thinking more largely, I think education is a really big space, like just as you can see with the contrast between me and Tessa as to how we're approaching this work. We are just two nonprofits who are doing work in a couple of school districts across the country. There are thousands of us. And the beauty of the nonprofit space is that nonprofits tend to be hyper-local. They are drilling into what is the need right here in your community. And by getting involved in with a nonprofit, be it via just donations, be it um getting involved in an associate board or on their actual board of directors or as a volunteer, there are so many ways that you can directly impact the needs that are happening right around in your exact school community. So, and many schools as I'll talk about in a moment are really underfunded. So therefore we need this kind of secondary uh, education and nonprofit space outside of just specifically the schools and the school district. We call this like this wider support network that makes our schools run. Schools are typically not um, offering like in-house after school programs, are not offering in-house like sexual education programs, are not offering theater, but like all of these like little things that make a full school experience are often supplemented by the nonprofit space. So I highly encourage you guys to like look around in your particular community and see um, what are the nonprofits that are supporting your local schools? Um, that's at a micro level. I think at a bigger level, we can also talk about what it means to be on school boards. Um, school boards are where decisions are made for your local schools, whether or not you have students there. It is so important that the wider community is involved in being able to attend meetings, calling upon where taxpayer dollars are going. Um, and like budgets, 
are approved in school board meetings. These are not things that are made behind closed doors and nobody ever sees. You can be there, you can talk about how much money is going to after school programs or teacher salaries. All of these things are up for discussion at a local level. Um, and then lastly, I think the thing that I will name is that really making sure that in every space we are listening to teachers and students. Education is a space that frequently the decision makers have never stood in a classroom or haven't stood in a classroom in 30 plus years. And so making sure that in every decision making room, we have a teacher who's there to give the on the ground perspective. We have a student there who can give the on the ground perspective. So that way, um, as legislators, as district officials, um, as PTA organizations are making decisions, we know that the, the voices who are impacted on a day-to-day -day basis are the ones that are being listened to. So um, as a volunteer, your role can also be to be the person calling that out, being like, is there a teacher there? Is there a student there? Can I bring a student to this room? Um, so there's so much power in everybody being able to kind of step forward and making sure the right voices are elevated. Yeah, making sure the right perspectives are being measured and weighed appropriately. I, I think that's really wonderful. And I would just shout out, you know, as someone who uh, voted in my primary elections a few weeks ago here in Charlotte, North Carolina, you know, a lot of our uh, school board seats were running unopposed, um, at least in the primaries. Um, they'll likely have more competition in the general, but still, I mean, it is a, a great call to action for all of us um, to just get engaged in maybe more ways um, than just volunteerism. Tessa, I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts that you want to build on um, from what was just shared. I think the only thing that I would add is right now is like a really interesting time particularly because during COVID schools received this like federal funding of ESSER dollars. Um, and that ends on September 1st, I believe is like when that funding is coming to an end. And so I know for nonprofits like us and across the country, like who had built like so much momentum in schools because there was all this funding for schools to allocate more resources towards um, mental health or hiring social workers or whatever it may be like that's coming to an end and so I think the more folks can attune to like what resources have like been in the community and are now going away as ESSER comes to an end and like getting behind that um, that would be just like my my only other thing to add because I think it's it, schools are in a really difficult position probably always, but particularly now it's really challenging um, with those budget cuts. Um, yeah. And I know we face that pretty significantly here in Denver. I'm really glad that you called attention to that. And Tessa, you actually set me up really well because we had a question come in from someone who can't join us live, but is going to be catching the recording of this. And they were just asking around how did the switch to virtual learning impact each of your organizations and some of the supportive uh, elements that I know your missions obviously are approaching education and, and supporting educators in, in very different ways. But I am curious if you're still feeling some pressures from COVID um, in addition to that funding piece that you just mentioned, Tessa. So either I, one can jump. Yeah, Tessa, please. Yeah, I think for us, like, because our tools are so plug and play, like they were really easy and ready to go for um, virtual learning. And That's we great. actually had like school social workers where they were able to take the lead is record themselves facilitating our tools and then deploy them to all the students in the school building, which actually like helped create more awareness of like who are the mental health professionals at the school. Um, I would just say that like, the anxiety and stress is still really increased post COVID like that hasn't gone away like um so I think when it comes to like were we able to deploy virtually yes um are we still seeing like significant needs for our programming um post COVID I think the answer is yes um so yeah that, that would just be like my two touch points great so it sounds like still um still evolving in, in a few ways too, it sounds like. Uh, Pallavi, I'm, I'm curious on your side of the house. 
Yeah, I think similar to, to Tessa, we were really lucky in terms of uh, our programming was delivered virtually uh, prior to COVID. So that transition for us um, was pretty seamless. But what we saw was a dramatic uptick in the demand and the need for teacher supports. Um, mm -hmm. As you can imagine, the pressures that teachers were facing during the pandemic and then also coming out of the pandemic as we went back in person really reframed for people. And I think across the, the industries, we saw a lot of people really do a, a reevaluation of what does work mean to us? And how are this my systems of work set up to support me as a whole person? COVID really was a transition point for a lot of people and educators are no different. And so as an organization, we are really working towards helping schools and principals figure out what does it mean to make school and schools a place that teacher, excellent teachers are excited to continue working in for the next 15, 20 years and like not driven on just passion, but like actual flexible work arrangements, proper benefits and pay and ability to learn and grow in their field and not just being told like, oh, you get summers off. Like that's that's not enough for um, to keep the best people in front of our students. Yeah. Keep coming back to that, uh, that really great poll quote of yours from earlier. Uh, passion doesn't pay the bills and you, you've got to make sure that you're satisfying other people's very real uh, professional development um, and other needs um, as professionals. So I want to get to, we're starting to get some questions in the chat. So we've got a good one here from Michael. He is with a foundation that focuses on uh, supporting uh, women and children uh, with disabilities. And it sounds like is considering uh, running activities or maybe is already running activities uh, with uh, local schools. Uh, so any advice from both of your perspectives on, um, you know, just from like a nonprofit leadership perspective, how to improve relationships between community nonprofits and the schools in that community? Open question for either. Okay, go ahead. I can. Yeah. Thank you, Polly. I a couple of things come to mind. So, I spent a lot of. I I like to joke that like I could earn a second like high school diploma for just like the amount of time I just spent like sitting in the back of classrooms and just talking with teachers and students and like just really taking the time to understand the community's needs without like hey, I have this great idea and we're going to like put it on you, but like really taking the time to understand what the need was within the community. So I think like first and foremost, like just meeting with local schools, meeting with students, meeting with community members. And I think what also I like, it can be hard in the nonprofit space, but like what we try to do is like also honor people's time with like particularly teachers, right? Like if they're, meeting with us like after school like can we provide them with a gift card or can we like how do we compensate them for their time or their expertise like as much as possible and honor that um even if it's just like we're gonna buy them coffee or whatever it may be like just to kind of have a round table discussion and we're like well food for everyone so I think like my recommendation is really to just always first like understand the need of like what your school locally needs and what is existing like what has historically worked and what has historically like not worked like really just trying to like get the comprehensive picture um would be like kind of like my first recommendation as to where to start i'm gonna like triple down on everything that tessa just said um in the nonprofit space we are here to serve and create impact and you can't serve and create impact unless you are listening to those who you are impacting. Um, as we know, like we, how many like of those spam calls do you get a day? Like the moment someone is selling something is the moment that we stop listening. And so really approaching the work from a, what do you need? And then how do I use my access to resources and capacity to providing and filling that need? Um, so yeah, I don't need to say any more. You nailed that. And I think, uh, Pallavi, what you just mentioned, uh, that, that underlining the importance of listening, uh, you know, 
approaching those conversations. Tessa, you you named this as well, but being open to conversations, um, being open-minded with the directions those conversations take. It sounds like that's also a good response to a question that uh, Gayatri posed in the chat as well, you know, a playbook on how to approach uh, local nonprofits, local education focused nonprofits or schools. It sounds like they're interested in lending professional skills to nonprofits, but unsure how to broach those conversations. It, it, it sounds like just reaching out and being willing to listen to and learn is a really good first step. And I'll also just plug my taproot hat on for a second. Taproot has a lot of really, really wonderful education focused nonprofits that um, they're putting their opportunities out into the world already. So don't be afraid to take advantage of those as well. Um, I want to get to another good question that we had posed in the chat here around impact measurement. So Andrea asked um, around your approach to measuring and then communicating the impact of what your organization does to these various groups of stakeholders and a, a lot of those types of stakeholders you've named already. Um, I'm curious if Tessa or Pallavi, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about how you do message um, the great work that you're doing. Pallavi, can we start with I you will... first? Great. Yeah, I can jump. Um... This impact measurement, I feel very strongly about. Um, there are, at this point, we're still kind of in an expansion era of like all of the different frameworks and metrics that you could possibly pick from. There's not like one aligned, like if you think about ESG, there's like one kind of framework that the world is working from. More largely in social impact, there's like 15 or 20. My suggestion, pick one. It doesn't matter which one, but you gotta have metrics. We are not doing anything unless we are moving the needle forward. I think our space gets ourselves in a lot of trouble in that if we are not talking about moving a needle, then this is the, the criticism we get of where are the dollars going? What are we doing? And, and so depending on your organization, pick three. It doesn't need to be that complicated. It doesn't need to be 10,000. But if you can pick three things that you can truly see um, what your programming is impacting, and that can be measured through beneficiary number of beneficiaries, it could be measured through dollars moved, it could be measured through like uh, beneficiary surveys, like how did they feel at the end of the experience? All of these are amazing metrics to be able to move forward, but track them. And once you start that rigorous tracking, the numbers will communicate themselves because the work you're doing is good. And as long as you have something to show at the end of it that says, like, look, I did this assessment of the work, that's the splashy line at the top of your annual report because you you track the numbers and they're real and you've been doing good work. So that's that's my suggestion. Find a, a impact framework, pick it, and just run with it. I love that. And and what I would say, like, we were very lucky. Our first grant was from Denver Public Schools, and they actually gave us one of their research partners. Um, just like from the very get-go. And so um, our research partner really designed like the surveys, like before the program and after the program to give to, to students and to teachers. And so, and we've stayed with that same research partner for the past seven years, um, which we've been really lucky to be able to do that. Um, but that can also be like a graduate school student or someone writing their dissertation too. Like, I think it's also really helpful um, to work like I am not a, a data expert um I like would not be the best person to like identify the scales that we now use so I'm really grateful that our research partner we were able to say like here's our theory of change right like this is what we hope to accomplish how would you go about measuring that um and and it's it's changed throughout the course of our journey too so like we had some scales that we used in the beginning of like upstream journey. And we learned like, oh, they're actually better scales that like better measure our program and outcome. Um, and so I, if you can, I do think like working with someone like, again, maybe that's a volunteer, right? Someone who is an expert in measurement um, has been really crucial to us. And then the other thing that we've done as well that we invest in is we capture videos of interviewing teachers or students on the program's impact 
and really sharing their story because um, some people like love numbers, some funders love numbers and some funders love stories. And so we try to like meet both needs of capturing the stories. And I think it's just much better um, coming from the people we serve. Um, so we do try to like make sure we capture that as well. And we've been playing with doing these like really bite-sized like 30 second videos that are vertical and look like a reel that you would see on social media to kind of capture um, those stories as well. And I think it's a nice communication with our funders of like once a month or once a quarter, we can say like, hey, here's a recent story we captured. Um, and then at the end of the year, they kind of know to expect from us or at the end of the school year, they know that they're going to get um, like a case study report on here's what we accomplished and here were our outcomes and here's what we used to measure. That's great. And I'm so glad that this question was posed too, because um, both responses have been really, really valuable in different ways. I mean, Pallavi, you touching on, like, you've got to define to what end, why are you doing this work? And that's going to be so critical, um, no matter what framework you choose, no matter what your reasons for the why are. Um, and then Tessa just sharing those concrete examples, which you're right, those are 100% great fits for um, Taproot volunteers, other pro bono resources that your organizations may already have in your network. So that's definitely something great to consider as well. And and I would add just from a nonprofit volunteer, you know, facilitating successful partnerships, it's completely acceptable for all of you volunteers or people who are thinking about volunteering on the line or listening to this back. Um, it is completely acceptable and encouraged for you as you're interviewing with the nonprofit that you're considering doing pro bono with, ask them about how they measure their impact and what are the big goals they're working on this year? How does this project tie into those big goals so that you feel really connected to that mission and to the, the driving forces um, that they're working on um, that year? So I know we're coming up um, on the end of the hour. It's really flown by. Uh, so I have one final rapid fire question for both of you um, as we close out the event. And it's just in it's honor of a Global Volunteer Month, which, as we talked about before, kind of a special time of celebrating volunteer service and inspiring more of it. So any final maybe quick advice or encouragement for people who are looking to get involved in this space, perhaps through pro bono service, perhaps through um, other means as well. Any final pieces of encouragement that you would both want to share? I think that similar to anything in the social impact space, this is our missions are going to continue to struggle for time, money, capacity, and it really takes people like finding that thing that is going to continue to drive their work, be it in a, like, this is your job day to day, or be it in a volunteer capacity um, or on a board of directors, but really finding that, that mission that speaks to like what is close to your heart. You heard both Tessa and I talk about like very personal experiences that drove us to the work that we're doing. And if you find that right alignment with like what is close to your heart, it's going to make those moments where like there's not enough money or you haven't heard from the executive director in three months because their their head's on fire or the volunteer event was a mess. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're all working towards that mission that we are really passionate about. And we know that our time and money and capacity is going to make a difference in the lives of the people that we are serving. So find that alignment that speaks to you. Love that. Tessa, what about for you? I think I just want to echo what Pallavi and I talked about earlier, which is like go on a listening tour. I think like if there's like one thing that I would like recommend anyone do on where to start is like what find whatever that like mission is that you're really curious about and really like listen to the stakeholders on what they need and the organization on what their needs are. Because I think as an ED, you can kind of get overwhelmed too of like people offering different things to you and you being like, do I really need this right now? So I think starting with like, listening to the community and the organizations on like what their needs actually are and then approaching of like what can I provide um that's where I would recommend folks start I love that very human-centric design-esque you know focusing on centering the affected community and decentering yourself from that process I love that 
All right. Well, we're we're right at the end of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap us up. But just want to say a thank you so much for everyone who attended live, and also thank you so much for anyone who is watching or listening to this recording back. We're really, really glad that you made this time uh, to come and join us. We'll follow up uh, later this afternoon or tomorrow morning with the recording of this event uh, and ways that you can keep in touch um, with both of these wonderful organizations, um, Upstream uh, Education, as well as Teachers Supporting Teachers. Um, and we hope that this is the start of many more conversations between you and, and their orgs, as well as other um, amazing education organizations um, across the Taproot community as well. Thanks everyone for joining in and give a, a big round of, of thank yous to our two speakers, uh, Palathy and, and Tessa as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. All right, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Bye now. <laughs>